So this session is about paraprosthetic aortic regurgitation following TAVI. And I think it's fair to say that this issue is probably the major concern that most people have about TAVI in general, and in particular uh, in intermediate <coughs> risk type patients. Corrado, how good do you think we are at predicting the likelihood of significant paraprosthetic aortic regurgitation? So, uh, with the help of the CT scan and the right choice of the <coughs> prosthesis, is very unlikely having a severe outer regurgitation. You could have a some, somewhat moderate outer regurgitation. And uh, I think that this all, this is all, because we have to choose the uh, best prosthesis for uh, any anatomical va variables or uh, individual anatomic uh, uh, sides and conformation. And um, at the beginning of the era of the TAVI, uh, we didn't use uh, uh, by routine the, the CT scan, and we didn't know that the paraprosthetic uh, outregurgitation was uh, a predictor of a mortality. Uh, and so we didn't care so much. Uh, now we, are, we learned that uh, how to position in a proper uh, 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 alignment the, the, the valve, the prosthesis, uh, how to select the proper uh, uh, prosthesis, and which is the best prosthesis per, per patient, per each patient. So I think that we can predict uh, only in uh, very uh, uh, unusual cases. And uh, in the majority of the cases, uh, we cannot predict. We cannot make the best choice, but we cannot predict the result. If there are a lot of calcification, could be more uh, frequent, uh, somewhat degree of outer regurgitation. But the real degree is difficult to establish. Okay. Well, so obviously, heavy calcification is an issue. Who else do, who else do you get worried about? In terms of PVL? Um, I personally think that, uh, I agree with you, what you're saying, Corrado, that uh, quite a few of the patients who had a significant PDL <coughs> in the past was due to undersizing. Mm. We, we, we measured the annulus too small using a trans thoracic echo and so on, but moving into CT scan and a 3D echo, I think, and maybe a little bit more aggressive oversizing, choosing the frame, it's not a big issue anymore. And also malposition of the frame too deep implantation is, is unlikely today. So I think the major causes, uh, as you say, Corrado, I think it's, uh, it's calcification, which prevents the frame to expand fully. And, uh, and I think the best predictor is uh, to look on the, on the leaflets to see if you have a big chunk of calcium, which is... Uh, eccentric calcification. Eccentric, yeah. And, um, and as, uh, for sure, I think that uh, you, you can, sometimes you can predict it, that these patients are at a high risk for a PVL, but it's hard to do anything up front to do it. You have to do it the normal way, uh, so I think that's for sure there's room for improvement uh, with new devices, new technology to, to get rid of uh, the PVL. Okay. So I'll stick with you, Lars. Core valve seems to be a predictor of more aortic regurgitation in some of the studies, but doesn't seem to have translated into increased mortality, whereas a lot of the trials suggest PVL is related to mortality. How do you explain that? One possible explanation could be that it's very difficult to quantify the degree of PVL. You know, we use a combination of echo <coughs> measurements, angiography, hemodynamics, and try to combine that and, and do a grading of it. But it's still, at best, semi-quantitative measurements. And, and I think quite a few people will, will weight the echo measurement very high in degree. And the cover frame and the adverse stand are different, and you, can, you could imagine that the, the, the way you see the PVL will be different in those two, and you'll grade them different. So I think that, that could be one explanation why you see it. Do you think the fact that it's self-expanding, maybe as time goes on, it's expanding more and aortic regurgitation is less, and that's why That was what we believed in the, in the early days, but I think uh, we all know so after five to ten minutes it got its full range of mm -hmm. Strength and, and I don't think it'll give you much more. Uh, you can try to go back to do a post dilatation, and it's also been described that people, despite post dilatation, couldn't get rid of it. They have implanted a second valve into it to get more radial 
force and, and could minimize the PVL. But I think the, the current technology with the Edwards and, uh, and with the core valve doesn't really ideal address the issue about PVL. We need some new technology, some improvement in, in the systems. Okay. We'll come on to the new technologies uh, in another session. So, Jonathan, for me, valve selection is all about a balance between avoiding oversizing and the risk of annular rupture, and on the other hand, avoiding undersizing and aortic regurgitation. Could you give us a summary of how you approach this issue and perhaps focus a little bit on the borderline cases? So, I, I just before I do that, echo everything that's been said, I think we are much, much better at assessing annular size relationship in the aortic root, uh, choosing the right valve for the right patient. I think we are far, far better at that. And if you look at the rates of uh, paravalvular AR in recent registries, and certainly our own data, it's very, very low. So I think, generally speaking, a lot of this is learning curve, or was learning curve. When we're looking at patients with borderline measurements, uh, so patients who fall between two devices, they're the most difficult quandary you face when we do the procedures. So, for example, those patients with relatively small annuli who fall between the 23 and the 26 millimetre valve, for example, and I suspect the same for the core valve. There are various ways that we assess this in a sort of semi-quantitative fashion. We look at not just the size of the annulus, but also the bulk of the leaflets, the eccentricity of the calcification, and the size of the sinuses, because what you want to do is put in a device that's big enough to fill the annulus, but not rupture the sinuses. Uh, and annular rupture is, is a major issue. So when we have borderline cases, we rely very, very heavily on interprocedural transsophageal echo. Mm -hmm. uh, and we take those measurements, perimeter, area, we circularize and assess a diameter. And we tend to take those measurements in designing valve size. Now, when we're truly on a borderline and we're not sure, one of the techniques that we sometimes do is do a balloon valvuloplasty with a contrast injection with the transsophageal echo and assess the space in the sinuses, the movement of the valve leaflets. It gives us more of an idea of movement of those valve leaflets and whether they'll obstruct the coronaries or whether they'll cause any rupture than giving us a true assessment of size. And then in those borderline cases, we tend to take either a slightly undersized bigger valve. So, for example, for the Edward system, a 26 millimeter device with two mil less in it, or a 29 millimeter device with three mil less in it, or a uh, smaller valve with slightly more in the balloon. I don't know whether that makes a difference because the frame is a fixed mm -hmm. is a fixed structure, uh, and that's what we will tend to do. I have to say that with the newer technologies, which we'll come on to specifically designed to reduce or lower the instance of paravalvular leak, we may see less concern about this over undersizing of the valve. We may be able to take the smaller prosthesis with a reduced risk of annular rupture and put it in a borderline annular. So I suspect that we will find the right device for the right patient in due course with two or three devices being available to us. Does this is a slightly tongue-in-cheek question. Does gender still enter your algorithm? When we started, it used to be man 26, yeah. woman 23. Does that still sometimes affect it, it the final It certainly affects us as operators, but I think if we, if we take the measurements and we take the imaging, we have to believe it. Mm -hmm. And the number of occasions we put in a 26 in what we think is a small woman and mm -hmm. a 23 in what we think is a, is a male annulus uh, with good results, we've done that. You have to believe the imaging person who's giving you the measurements, uh, and you have to take that, I think. So I think we are moving away, I hope, from that automatic 23 for a woman, 26 for a male. But it, it's generally true. So hold your breath. Yeah. Lars, anything to add to that? No, I, um, I agree. I mean, um, and I think you need proper imaging up, to, up front to measure the analyst size and, uh, and try to confirm it. Can I add some? Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, if I can just make a comment. Um, compared to the first phase of this adventure, transcavular adventure, I think we are a little bit more, well, we learned a lot and we are maybe a little bit more aggressive as well. Means, meaning that uh, at the beginning we were afraid about reballoning, either uh, balloon expandable and self expandable valve. Right now we do it 
almost routine, routinely or always, uh, which means that probably we, can, we, now, we know that we cannot accept some degree of aortic insufficiency, paravalvular leakage. So probably we know what to do right now. So new devices will be, are welcome, of course, because they will solve some problems. But right now we, right now we know that we can reballoon with very low risk of annulus rupture. We can do valve in the valve. So we have some, um, I mean, some, um, something that can be done during the procedure in order mm -hmm. to reduce the risk of PVL. Well, that was due to be my next question, actually. So when you see aortic regurgitation, yep. A, how do you assess it? And B, how do you treat it? Assess by transesophageal echocardiogram, because we always use that, it's routine, and injections. Once we have an idea of the aortic regurgitation, and of course, uh, diastolic pressures, uh, if uh, we consider that it's a little bit too high compared to the standard, we go for a reballoning, that's the first option. If it's uh, result solved, it's okay. If not, we can consider the option of uh, valve in valve. And that's, um, I think everything has, been, has changed compared to the past when we were afraid to do valve in valve. Right now, again, it's almost routine. If we have a paravalvular leak, we can solve it with mm -hmm. some, uh, uh, with adding a new valve. Well, I think that speaks miles for how behind we are on imaging. Uh, and, uh, and I'm referring for the paravalvular leaks, there are basically two issues. One is the intrinsic issue of each device, the mechanism of their deployment, the mechanism of action, and what protective effects they may have built in. That's one issue. The other issue is how do we understand the substrate on where we are putting the valve. And we are calling calcium, uh, but all calcium is not the same. We may have the same Hounsfield units of uh, density uh, in the CT scan uh, for two equal amounts of calcium, but the density of that calcium, the compressibility of that calcium is totally different. And this is something that we cannot predict yet. Uh, I think there is, uh, there is an early work that is being done by the group in, uh, in Zurich uh, with Folkman, uh, Falk and uh, their, their team, uh, where uh, they're trying to analyze this data and uh, input that into a mathematical model. Uh, this is where I think the future is, where we can, uh, we are talking about doing a study together on, on that, basically trying to predict mathematically how this calcium is going to react not only on the basis of where they are located, but what other parameters do we have, putting tens, tensile strengths uh, and building up on, on, a, on, a, on an FEM uh, program that you can predict how this calcium, and I think this is what is going to be the way of dealing and minimizing the amount of parabolic leaks, or how to deal on a parabolic leak once you implant the valve. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in terms of assessment of aortic regurgitation, we, like you, I, we tend to assess it fairly subjectively. I, we have a look at it and see what we think. Is anyone more objective, aortic regurgitation index, percentage of circumference? I, uh, I think this, uh, this, this sitting index, the aortic regurgitation index, for sure if you have a patient in general anesthesia, I don't think you can, you can it doesn't apply to those patients. Hemodynamic is, change in some way, and you can see patient up before the procedure having absolutely no research, <coughs> you can calculate the AI index and get it to 20, which should be a severe research. And so I think at least in general anesthesia, it doesn't apply. It would be nice, that's what we're looking for, just a factor where we can uh, no, put it, yeah, exactly. We, we use it, we use it. Okay. Yeah, but maybe it's better in, in local anesthesia, yeah. I would we assume. Yeah. Sufficiency index. But it's not unusual that patient Run Sometimes. with a diastolic pressure of 35, 40 uh, without mm -hmm. any regurgitation uh, in, yeah. in the cat lab. So. But the anesthesiologists can play with the hemodynamics. I mean, they can load, they can yeah, use... Uh, yeah. I mean, they do that in the OR yeah, for, uh, for... I don't really understand what's, what the mechanism about, but it, for sure it's, it's very unusual in patients. In, in, yeah. 
Is it right that sometimes it's difficult to evaluate? Another yeah. point is that you can calculate simply the diastolic pressure and looking if it's more than 50 or less than 50 according to systolic pressure. But, but uh, is it an in somewhat uh, helpful, somewhat helpful? I also agree, of course, we should try to minimize it and also get completely rid of any PVL. But we also know that some patients will tolerate some degree of aortic regurgitation. Some yeah. patients tolerate it very poorly. I mean, patients yeah. with small cavity, hypertrophic LV, doesn't tolerate it. But patients with dilated LV, it much, better. much better. So you factor that in when you're deciding whether to... I just think it's the whole issue about predicting which one it is, how to, to do the procedure, how to assess it, and, mm -hmm. and, and how to use this assessment for what to do for this patient is, is, is a very complex... Uh, I'm still not sure we understand the data on AR. I don't understand that relationship, the mortality relationship. It, it doesn't make sense. It's linear from mild, moderate to severe in the partner data. It, it just seems to me a marker for something else. It, it, I'm not quite sure we've got a handle on why that relates to mortality. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Uh, uh, but anyway, it's important to, to not leave the lab with a significant exactly. leak. Exactly. And it's important that's to know sure. what, what mechanism the, the leak is. And that's where imaging at the time is very important. So I think it's... It's why we rely on, on TOE uh, a great deal during the procedure, because if we have AR, we want to know the mechanism. Is it transvalvular, is it paravalvular? The, the, the treatments for both are completely different. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's, it's important to, to know what you're dealing with. So am I right in thinking balloon valvular plasty was done quite a lot early on, and then there was the story about increased incidence of stroke, and I think Perhaps now we're doing a bit more balloon valvuloplasty. Is that fair to say? Is that, your, is that what's happening in your labs? At least uh, post dilatation has become no. more yes. common. You, you, yeah, can, you can discuss what about <coughs> pre dilatation because some, some centers will, uh, won't do that anymore. Um, at least for the core valve, where everyone, at least more experienced centers, will try to implant very high to, to get rid of the conduction abnormality. It can cause a problem about post dilatation because you, if you adjust that one or two millimeter below the annulus, do the post dilatation, you may end up in some cases where you have a pop out in a, in a supular position. So it's, it's, it's a, <laughs> it is difficult to do to, to say what you should do for. It's for, becoming more complex. It is <laughs> not, not less. Okay, that's very interesting. An interesting talk. Okay. So aortic regurgitation after TAVI remains an important issue for the TAVI community, but seems to be coming less common, and that's probably because we're getting better and putting more attention into the detail of assessment, and we're probably generally putting in bigger valves than we used to. But we all agree that imaging the valve uh, is crucial, and there seems to be uh, less reluctance to proceed to balloon aortic valvuloplasty after a TAVI procedure in the uh, context of anything more than mild aortic regurgitation. Thank you very much.